All right, Chris, I need you to give me one word. One word that describes the Carolina Panthers right now. One word. I want you to think of just one. The first word that pops into your head, go. Can I give you two? No, one. I want one. Okay, dumpster. Dumpster? Well, I'm gonna say, you're going to say dumpster fire. I'm yes. sure. You're gonna say. My yes. word, dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. Kind that of the works. same thing. It works. Kind of the yeah. same thing. That's where we are right now. <laughs> All right, let's get this sucker started. The state of North Carolina covers 53,000 square miles. It is the habitat of the feared Carolina Panthers. Get dialed in, Panthers fans, for an in-depth look at your team. Exclusive interviews. Locker room insight. Let's huddle up for Panthers Playbook. Here are your hosts, Dennis Cox and Chris Lee. Welcome back to another episode of Panthers Playbook. That is Chris Lee. I'm Dennis Cox. Uh, before we get into, we're actually going to talk about Bryce Young a little bit today because we really haven't done a full, like, just an episode of talking about Bryce. But we're also going to dive into the article that was published by The Athletic today by Joe Person, who covers the Panthers as, his, as a beat reporter for The Athletic, and Diana Rossini, who covers the NFL as a whole for The Athletic, formerly of ESPN, Diana Rossini. But before we get into all that, Make sure you smash the subscribe button and leave your thoughts in the comments section below. We want to hear your thoughts as fans. It's a sounding board for you all. You might disagree with what Chris and I talk about, and that is totally okay. We want to hear your thoughts and opinions below. And we definitely want to hear your thoughts and opinions on the dysfunctional dumpster fire (laughs) that is the Carolina Panthers right now. Because, Chris, there's some pretty scathing stuff that The Athletic uh, reported on Wednesday of this week the day that we were actually reporting, uh, re- recording this episode, a lot of scathing stuff about some stuff that happened in the organization involving Frank Reich, people going behind Frank Reich, people going directly to David Tepper or general manager Scott Fitterer, just complete and total garbage in terms of how this Panthers organization is run right now. Dumpster. Yeah, that's the word. I mean, and and we'll add the fire along with that. Um, And part of the headline says Hunger Games culture. Yeah, that was uh, what was described. Uh, And I pulled up the article just so we could kind of uh, talk about it as it's there. But it's it just kind of it's so interesting. All the crap that we gave Matt Rule. Mm -hmm. And it's like if Matt Rule was an F. Frank Reich was like you just showed up to put your name on the test and did nothing else. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And like, um, and, and what's interesting too, is I uh, saw uh, a piece of an interview from uh, Jeff Saturday when he was uh, on the Pat McAfee show and he was kind of describing the culture or lack thereof that he took over in Indy and how much that was a dumpster fire. And he mm-hmm. knew coming into that, that they weren't going to win any games He's just literally trying to keep the trains on the track. He wasn't there to, like, if we want a game, cool. I'm just trying to make sure we keep it the trains on the track so the next guy, when they get here, they have something to build off of. Because when he got in there, it was nothing. And it's like, wow, if it was that bad in Indy, again, it was that bad here. And it makes me wonder, what is it about Frank Reich? Because, you know, when we talk to other people about him, they're they're raving about the man he is mm-hmm. and even people on the current coaching staff he's such a good man there's people who cover him he's such a good man me and you talk to boomer Esiason. we're going to talk to boomer Esiason again uh next week he's going to say he's one of my good friends he's such a good man but why is he such a crappy leader if this is the case right like now you have two nfl franchises that he's basically put in ruins 365 days apart from each other yeah uh so it's it's very interesting to see that and see that coaches were going behind his back to talk to david tepper like yo stuff isn't going right or this is what we really need to be doing with bryce maybe we should sit him down this scheme it doesn't quite work he's forcing this thing and you know also a lot of the coaches were upset with the um play calling change when frank reich took it back as well according to that same article so it's like all the things that we were upset about, the coaches were upset about it as well, Mm -hmm. which caused a lot of dysfunction to cause that dumpster fire. So in the article by The Athletic, which, by the way, they talked to 20 people, whether they're coaches 
players, other league sources, again, some speaking on condition of anonymity, uh, but it, we're talking about 20 people. So this is not an article that was just like, oh, we're reporting on a game that happened. This is something that they've been probably working on for several weeks right now. And yeah. there's a quote from one assistant that said, quote, people just finger pointing, hoping they don't get exposed. And this is something that we always see in, in pro sports, uh, whether it's NFL, NBA, whatever it might be. But generally, either when a coach gets fired or a player gets traded, you hear the negative stuff start to come out generally, right? Like, well, you know, this player, you know, didn't get along in the locker room super well, or the coach didn't have the right culture, or, you know, lost the locker room, whatever it might be. You hear this kind of stuff. But we're hearing stuff on a completely different level than what we're used to hearing. The fact that there are some coaches on the team, assistants believe that they're undermining other coaches mm -hmm. basically in self-preservation mode hence the hunger games aspect of all this uh, our friend tim donnelly from the drive on 99.9 the fan actually kind of sounds like game of thrones uh for me to watch that but there are also a belief that other staff members were text text messaging sending text messages to david tepper himself behind reich's back about issues that they saw so it's like we don't want the owner impacting stuff that happens on the field right in terms of game plans and all that kind of stuff but we have assistant coaches going directly apparently to the owner and the general manager himself well how is he not going to intercede you know that's the thing is that there were obviously there are fractures within the coaching staff and this is the whole thing we're talking about this goes so beyond even just a single player or just the players on the field with players on the field or trust me aren't without fault but this is something that is what we like to use the word systemic, right? Like this is a top down type thing. And this is the culture that David Tepper has allowed to happen. <clears throat> you know, maybe that's, maybe that's yeah. the reason why Frank Wright got yeah. fired so quickly is because maybe he saw the culture eroding even faster. And he's like, got to pull it, you know? And, and this does ha go to David Tepper as well, because, um, you know, in the article, it, it definitely says, and, you know, it's something that, uh, has been speculated something I thought that David Tepper wanted, um, you know, Frank Reich to hire outside of his immediate Rolodex. He wanted him to go out there, find some new people. Um, and, you know, we talked about relationships earlier and mm -hmm. how people said he's a good man. A lot of those guys who may did, maybe didn't know Frank Reich beforehand, but knew of him through mutual friends. A lot of them said they took the job because of Frank Reich mm -hmm. and the reputation that he had um around the nfl so um all of that is, is is very interesting and with david tepper wanting to basically force frank reich to build the team the way he wanted to you, you kind of wonder if the mix and personalities is the reason why the offense looks as clunky as it does right now why the operation of the team looks as clunky as it does right now um you know frank reich was always talking about how collaborative it is for everybody to work together and it makes me wonder was it really collaborative mm -hmm. or were, is, was that the word that you wanted to use in front of the media so people can get the clue we need yeah. to work together this we need to do this together so we need to figure out how to take what you did here what you did here what i did here and what you did here and bring that all together and can you do that um one thing that I thought was interesting, and here's a quote from the article that I thought was very interesting. It says, quote, it was just not a good offense, one staffer said. You didn't see Indy's offense when they were second in the league rushing in 2021. You didn't see Philly uh, when he was there or when he was with the Chargers and those dynamic offenses. You didn't see any of that. Now, my ears or eyes perked up when I was reading that. And it said, you didn't see. Is that because they're referring to Reich in past tense? Or is this somebody else who's not, who's also without a job right now? Yeah. That leaves two other people. Was that Josh McCown or was that Deuce Staley talking about that? Mm -hmm. And maybe are they one of, or two of the guys that, had some issues and went behind folks backs which is maybe why they got let go you know what i'm saying so yeah. like it's it's one of those weird things like you kind of get last year steve wilkes takes over and he tells uh phil snow hey you can go ahead and 
you can leave with with rule because you know he wanted to put in his own defense he wanted to make sure his defense was there and the way you know and, he, and he's not going to do that with phil snow being there but chris Tabor, he has nothing to do with the offense he's a special teams coordinator so we're looking for reasons as to why he would dismiss two coaches and maybe this article is is exposing some of the reasons why this is yeah. just speculation we don't know who but this is just the speculation that I have, especially after reading that quote. Well, here's the thing to keep in mind is that Deuce Staley was the running backs coach in Philadelphia during a time when Frank Reich was there. So mm -hmm. like those, the, they're, they're, they're boys, they're, they're guys. And Josh McCown was a quarterback in Philadelphia when Reich was also there. And while Deuce Staley was also there. So that's where the connection all comes in. So these were quote unquote Reich guys. And ironically, not ironically, but sure enough, all the right guys are gone. So we're not entirely sure what's going on uh, behind the scenes with that. But here, here's one thing, though, to, to think about. Deuce Staley wanted to come closer to home. He said that. Yeah. Also, Josh McCown, this is his first NFL job as, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not being a player, but on a coaching staff. So if guys were going to self-preservation mode, wouldn't those two be guys who could potentially go in self-preservation mode, especially if you see the, the ship going down. Now I'm not trying to put anything out there like, yeah. you know, or trying to make, you know, something out of nothing. Right. But like, you know, somebody who wants to stay close to home because they're from the, this area or somebody who is looking at the writing on a wall and doesn't want to see his NFL career as a coach blow up in his face, his first year, you know, I don't know. It's just, it, there's a lot to think about a lot. That's crossed my mm -hmm. mind. And those two things that you brought up crossed my mind as well, but also the self-preservation thing in there. Just, you know, when it's going down, everybody is on their own. They're saving themselves. Oh, yeah, 100%. There are four key pieces, four key players, four key, I say players, uh, four key cogs to the machine in the NFL. One, it's the owner. Two is the general manager. Three is the head coach. Four is your starting quarterback. Those four things have to all be on the same page. Ooh. They all four of those things have to be on the same mm. page because if you're not, you get what we have with the Carolina Panthers right now, mm. because clearly, so according to the article, the plan was for Bryce Young in his first year, we're going to get into Bryce. This will lead us into Bryce. The first year was for him to learn how to call plays in a huddle based off of hearing, you know, the play call to him and regurgitating that to the, to the huddle and, and such, because it's different in college when they just have, you know, signs up on the sidelines and stuff. So calling plays in a huddle, and just the overall grasp of the system and the offense, right? Just understanding the, the concepts and all those kinds of things. After this season, so in the offseason 2024, start to really work and hone in on some of his mechanics. So that was a thing that was apparently was agreed upon by everybody, all right? But then you apparently allegedly have some coaches talking about some of the footwork and mechanics of Bryce Young saying he's not getting deep enough in some of his drop sets and things along those lines, which is leading to several of the sacks because there's inconsistencies there. So, all right, wait, hold on. I thought we weren't working on the mechanics until the off season. So then you have people, you have assistant coaches going to Tepper, you have assistant coaches going directly uh, to the general manager, Scott Fitterer, and then Fitterer is relaying this information up to, to Tepper, who's saying these things to Frank Reich. So there's no synergy between your owner gm coach and quarterback none none whatsoever if those four things aren't lined up you have what we have with the carolina panthers and right now they don't even have a head coach right now it's just the interim chris Tabor. those four key things if you don't have those your organization sucks simple as that simple as that add in the nugget that bryce young isn't who frank reich wanted in from the beginning and, what we heard, and, yeah. and and that's and that's where you have some of that dysfunction between all that. And so one of the criticisms that Dennis me and you got from folks who listen is that we weren't being hard enough on Bryce. And from the psychology standpoint of a upset Panthers fan who went through, think about the five years uh, that the Carolina Panthers had before David Tepper owned the team. Mm -hmm. One of those years, they didn't make the playoffs. That was 2016. Yeah. It's a down year. It was still six and ten. Still had, uh, you know, some key players there on the team, and those players, for the most part, came back. Thinking about Cam Newton, uh, Thomas Davis, Luke Keekley, Greg Olson, folks like that. 
So anybody after that, especially a quarterback, uh, you know, they're going to be compared to the best franchise quarterback that's ever played in that jersey, which is Cam Newton, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's, absolutely. That's probably why fans were out on Teddy Bridgewater fast. That's why, you know, it was hard to get behind a Kyle Allen. That's why it was hard to really get behind Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield. And, you know, the list goes on and on and on, right? And the hard part for that is, like, you couldn't have drafted a completely opposite person than Cam Newton. So I'm not coming in expecting Cam Newton things. Oh, yeah. Cam Newton could extend the play in ways that Bryce Young just can't. And he will not, right? Cam Newton can run over the linebacker. The linebacker is going to demolish Bryce Young. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. And then, so I'm just kind of thinking about it that way. Like, okay, let me not look at him and put Cam Newton expectations on him. Cam was so, just different. Cam was Cam just, is just different. different, right? Just different. So, what okay. are the ex so what are the expectations? He's he's supposed to be accurate throwing the ball and makes great decisions. And I think, for the most part, we've seen that, right? When he has time. And there's been charts that's come out to say that he's – the most accurate quarterback in the tightest windows in the NFL right now when he has time mm -hmm. and how often does he have time? Like Dennis, he's on pace to be sacked 64 times this season. That's not fun for anybody. That'd that's be the fourth fun. most in NFL history, by the way. That's that's even if that was Cam Newton at six foot five, 265, 250 pounds, excuse me. That wouldn't be fun for him. That that puts him at danger, and he was at danger. We saw what ended up happening to him, right? Yep. So when you have that, and then you also include what we already know about the receivers, they're not getting open. Mm -hmm. They're not creating separation. The offensive line is letting everything leak through. We just you just alluded to the dysfunction between all the four important pillars to any football team. We don't need to go over that again. We know all of that was in dysfunction. The head coach didn't want him. There's other coaches going behind um, you know, his back to talk to David Tepper about issues. There's problems there. Mm -hmm. And then on top of all of that, the scheme sucks yeah. because you're trying to marry things that probably just don't blend together. And you're telling me I'm supposed to sit here and say, but Bryce Young, but Bryce Young, has he made some bad plays and some bad decisions? Oh, yes, yeah. He's a, he's a rookie. Absolutely. He's a rookie. And if this was Andy Dalton playing in his, what, 13th year, being a starter all year, would I have more to say about the quarterback position? You're damn right I would be, right? Yeah. But this is a rookie quarterback who there's already – there's some dysfunction as to if everybody even wanted him or not, right? And everything we just named, how is he supposed to get over this? And so that's why I haven't been as critical. I don't think he's he's had a fair shot for me to, to be critical of him. And so you look at C.J. Stroud, the person he's going to be compared to the most, looks like he has a great situation with the Texans. His coaching situation is solid. His offensive line is solid. Just lost Tank Dell. But he had a very solid, you know, receiving core, mm -hmm. right? It could have been better, but he was in a situation where he could succeed. Bryce is not in a situation where he can succeed. I have more to say about this, but I've been talking too long, and I'll sure. let you go ahead. I mean, if you look at Bryce so far this season, just in, in terms of what he's done on the field, I, I he he definitely deserves some critique as well and some criticism because we haven't seen the arm strength that we normally expect to see. Even on some of the deep throws, it's like, ah, uh, a little – thought we expect a little bit of a stronger arm so there are some of those things i will say there are some of the decision making has been in the sense of like he's just kind of seeing things and he's panicking a little bit like in the last game he just got pressure and just threw the ball to the side like to the left i was like dude where are you going with the ball like you didn't even look to see even see if miles sanders was there for a check down you just threw it laterally and just goes out of bounds you lost yard some of the decision making has shall, been really good we Shall we analyze why? Well, again, he was under pressure, but again, it's the panic. That's on Bryce. The panic is on Bryce. I will say this. When you do get pressure like that, you do get a bunch of things going through in your head. Um, but some of the sacks are because when we talked to Boomer Esiason, when we talked to Boomer Esiason, Chris, when I asked him what's his biggest weakness, he said he's not throwing with anticipation. That's something that is learned over time. And I think that sometimes he might not see 
starts throwing with anticipation, and that's the reason why he's like, ah, I missed it, and he holds on to the ball, and then he gets flushed out of the pocket, gets sacked. So some sacks are on him. Some sacks are on the offensive line. Some sacks are on the scheme. It's not just one thing. It's a combination of all of it, all right? It's a combination of all of it. The O-line does suck. The scheme does suck. And the wide receivers, I had, there's one person in the comment section that said, wide receivers don't get open in the NFL. You have to throw them open. I was like, Open in the NFL might just be literally like a half yard or like a half a step. I'm like, that's open in the NFL. Carolina Panthers receivers can't even do that. But this is where I, I, I'm i not going to label this kid a bust right now because of this. When you clearly have dysfunction in your coaching staff where you probably had one coach or a couple coaches telling you one thing, another coach trying to tell you another thing, we should do this or we should do that, try this thing or try that thing. You're pulling me in three different directions. Where am I supposed to go? You know, there's no direct line of we are going this way as a team, as a unit, we might lose games, but we're moving forward in this direction. It might be the wrong direction, but at least you're going somewhere and Carolina right now behind the scenes, clearly the dysfunction ain't helping the kid out. I don't think you can get a fair evaluation. Oh, you can't. Bryce is, where he could go, and what he possibly is. And, again, every week, for every bad decision or bad thing that we saw about Bryce Young, there's also at least two more great decisions that he made. Mm -hmm. So he has, like, he's seeing the ghost to talk about Sam Darnold, mm -hmm. but he also made a lot, of, a lot more better decisions than what Sam Darnold did when he was in his uh, first couple years in the league. Like, Bryce Young is still making some really good plays. There are certain certain games where, like, literally, if Bryce Young didn't make the throws he did or escape the pocket when he did or make the throwaways that he did at that those particular times, the Carolina Panthers don't even get close to being in, in those particular games. He can't help what the scheme is or who, what's around him. So, like, we just don't have a fair evaluation of oh, him right Oh, we don't. Now. So that's no. why, like, for me, it's like I can't come on here and, and literally and criticize dude. I just – I can't. And I've seen some people say that, he needs to to quiet up the crowd or, you know, everybody who's criticizing him. He needs to go out there and have a 300-yard game. With who? Yeah. With who? Yeah. What With time what? is he going to get to throw that? What, like, who is he going to throw it to? Who's going to be down the field? The offense, if you look at a lot of, like, I've been, I've been at all the games so far this season, and literally most of the, the route – combinations are everybody go up 10 yards and come back and when defenses know that and they can see that they can sit on it there's not people going deep <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah. and even if they are going deep he doesn't have time so if he's going to dink it to somebody who's eight yards away they're going to get tackled immediately that's going to be very hard for him to get 300 yards especially when he's being sacked and being pressured i'm sorry that but it's going to be very hard for him to do that that's not on bryce that is not on Bryce. And so I think people get so frustrated with the quarterback position. They put so much on that position. They're not thinking about what's around them, what the quarterback has to work with. Now, give me a great offensive line, some weapons, and, and install something that works with his skill set, like he had at Alabama. Then now we're talking. And if he sucks in that, well, he just can't make it in the NFL. Yeah, that's the thing. And I know a lot of people will make the comparison of like, well, not, you know, some of the great quarterbacks don't always have great weapons and stuff around them. I was like, well, I mean, but there's something every, like every team needs like every every great quarterback always had something great around him in some way, shape or form, whether it's an elite receiver or a great offense line or something along those lines. Every quarterback out there needs help. It's as simple as that. You just do. So it's way too early to make a judgment, in my opinion, on Bryce. If people think that he's a bust, that's fine. You are more than welcome to think that that is your your prerogative. You can do that 100 percent with OK with you making that choice yourself. It's just way too early to sit there and say this dude's a bust. Simple as that. That's what I think. And until there's actually stability in the organization, the guy, unfortunately, is going to continue to fail. Or the team's going to continue to fail, and he's just going to be part of that because there's just dysfunction in the organization. It's as simple as that. Until that's fixed, until there's stability there, no one's going to succeed on this team. And let me put this out there, too, because, like, Dennis, you know this, uh, but Panthers' playbook wasn't started then. But before the draft... Mm -hmm. When me and you on radio together, when we were, uh, you know, doing, you know, TV hits or whatever together and 
talking on culture state and all that good stuff. I was always for the Carolina Panthers going for CJ Stroud. Yeah, that you is, and I both that's, were. That's the guy that I wanted because he was the best uh, pure as, pocket passer, especially after his performance in the CFP last year. Mm-hmm. And that's the that's the main thing I got up because the question mark was: Does he have escapability? Is he mobile? And we didn't really see that at Ohio State, and he showed it a little bit against Georgia last year. Now, with that being said, he still isn't the most mobile guy. He has a little bit of ability, but do you really think C.J. Stroud would look a lot better in this offense with what's going on with this team, with this dysfunction, and these same weapons, this scheme, that offensive line, this same coach that got fired? Do you think C.J. Stroud will look like he's the rookie of the year right now leading uh, all, all passers in the NFL right now? Probably not. <laughs> with Adam Thielen as your number one? Probably not. Like, come on, man. Let's 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 use our heads here. Yeah, exactly. It, that's. I'll wrap things up on this. Is that a lot of people expect that the quarterback is just going to be the savior and that it just cures all? It's not the case. He's not Superman. He's not. And we got to remember that here in Carolina. Forget that. That's a high bar for anybody to get to. Now, mm-hmm. if we drafted Anthony Richardson. Okay, similar profile, similar skill set. He's not Superman. We got to stop looking at people like Cam Newton. We got to get over that. Cam Newton's not coming back. He came back once. He's not coming back again. We got to get over that. And we're giving him that Cam Newton bar, and he will not never live up to it if that's, that, that's what you're looking for. That's going to wrap it up for this episode of Panthers Playbook. Make sure, again, you smash the subscribe button. Let us know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Saints this Sunday. We'll see how it all turns out. We'll see you next time. We'll have another episode for you after Sunday's game, by the way. Let's have some fun, right? I guess. Yeah. It's winnable. No Derek Carr. It's winnable. Yeah, they're probably like, yeah, guys, they got the Panthers. (laughs) (laughs) Jameis Winston's like, let's go. (laughs) Somebody's going to be NFC Player of the Week. For the Saints. (laughs) For the Saints. For the Saints, yes. Sorry, I needed to specify. We'll see you guys on Sunday.